I kind of wanted to start this by saying that several years back, and this would have been probably before my book started in 2007, it was the year before that that I met Gershon Solomon, who was with the Temple Mount Faithful in Israel and working to rebuild the Third Temple. And he came to speak at a congregation down in the Denver area. So I traveled there to go see him speak. And he took the time to let me get down on his level and you know uh, he was sitting in a chair he had been run over by a tank previously in one of the wars that Israel fought and had a miracle where um, an angel appeared to him and said that God was not finished with him and all of this interesting miraculous events happened to him he took the time to speak to me and he looked at me with very loving eyes. Um, it was kind of funny, I thought, because a lot of the men were really jealous that he was spending time talking to me and they kind of bumped me out of the way, the guys that were in that church. It's, it's not my church. I just heard that he was coming there to speak, so they were like, all right, your time's up. And I was like, wow, you know, what attitudes. But he didn't even care. He just went right along talking to me and kept contact, you know, took my um, address and phone number, all that information. So this was the reason why my miracle happened in the first place that started the writing of my book. Because when I had... The miracle happened where I was awakened at 4 a.m. and all of this. It was like an electricity about me and seriously was like a download from heaven of information. And I was like, wait a minute, wait a minute, let me get some paper. And I went to write it down. And the Lord um, impressed me to go to the library where I could use the computer at the time I didn't have a computer and told me to send the message to Jerusalem immediately and I was to send it to his office and uh, you know the story is in my book the almond tree Aaron's rod the Messiah King of Israel and um, I won't go off into that story that's in my book but I'll just tell you this that Gershon would send the newsletter out and I would get the newsletter and read what they had been doing and they always did a march from the tomb of the Maccabees where they actually found some of the actual graves of the Maccabees in this old cave that's there and it's kind of hidden so he knew where it was so they would march um, to the Temple Mount from there, from Modin. And at one point he had asked all of the people that were following him to write a letter to the Vatican, a personal letter, to ask them to look for the temple artifacts that were taken during the um, Titus siege when he came in with the Romans took the um, temple vessels to Rome and you know they uh, melted all the gold off the walls of the temple and they said that the Romans were turning the stones over and the gold was just melted pouring down and they would you know they captured all the gold basically and they actually found a plaque in the Roman Colosseum that said that the gold from the temple had helped to build the Roman Colosseum so Gershon had requested that people ask the Vatican to write a personal letter there and he gave the address and I wrote a letter asking them to please return the temple vessels from the second temple if they had them in the Vatican. Well, 
I mean, just the other day, there was this article in Israel 365 News, and Diana Ketterman um, sent it to me. And so I wanted to talk about this article and the fact that they're now saying that, in fact, some of the temple vessels really are there. Now, there was always a question whether they were there or not. But uh, one of the things I talked about in my book was that some of the artifacts that were taken out of the temple were held in a building called the Temple of Peace. And it had these pink marble floors in the Temple of Peace. And fairly recently, they started excavating and they actually found the marble floor of that building. But what had become of the temple vessels and uh, objects of utensils and things that they had used in the Jerusalem temple had been seen by several people, several rabbis that had traveled to the Vatican and were given access to see them. So I kind of wanted to tell the story and tell you what's happening with that with this updated article. The story was something that I talked about, like I said, in my book. But this is something that is just like an update now. And now they are saying that there are temple vessel artifacts in the basement of the Vatican. So I wanted to talk about the rabbis that claim to have seen these things. and. There was an article, February 10th of 2022, it says, Is there new evidence of Jewish temple treasures in the Vatican? There are several people alive that can personally attest to being eyewitnesses of the Vatican possessing temple vessels, including the menorah candelabra. Pretend for a moment that the Vatican has in its possession some sacred and precious relics that were originally in the Herodian Jewish temple located in Jerusalem 1950 years ago. If you were the Pope living in the 14th century and could verify this fact, would you not ask yourself how indeed such Jewish artifacts had come to your residence in the first place? And let me say that they've been denying that they were there all this time because even when Gershon kept sending letters to them, they would simply not comply or admit that they were there. After some digging around, no pun intended, you would have found that your new Vatican residence was actually built over sections of Caesar's palace. The Vatican, including St. Peter's Basilica, was constructed over Emperor Vespasian's Roman palace approximately 200 years after the sacking of Rome in 455 AD. Indeed, there are excavations going on there right now, even as you read this magazine. What this means is that the Vandals and the Visigoths passed over or simply didn't find the select treasures secreted away in that palace and instead took with them the many items on public display in the temple that was the Temple of Peace located not far away. It says in the Talmud that the famous Jewish sage and author of the Zohar, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, went to Rome with his colleagues to nullify harsh decrees placed on Judea. And while there, he saw the exact items mentioned in this article. They ended up being royal guests at Vespasian's palace after being asked to attend to his ailing daughter. When they miraculously did heal her, the sages were afforded the chance to see these extremely holy items, proving that they were kept in that place. In fact, historian Josephus Flavius records the event in which Vespasian took for himself these items specifically as his special treasures for safekeeping, including an ancient Torah scroll. According to Vatican expert Dr. Michael A. Calvo, those vessels and others found their way to the Vatican via another route, 
after making their way to Byzantium. These include temple candelabra given to Pope Innocent III by Baldwin I after the sacking of Constantinople and the massacre of the Christian Orthodox population. Now there's something about Baldwin. I think he had the th crown of thorns and perhaps the Shroud of Turin in his possession. Kelvo claims temple shofars and utensils, garments of the high priest, the zitz, which is a gold crown, uh, it says a gold plaque with the words Kodesh la Hashem, holy to the Lord, cultural objects, and many other objects of the art, books, and manuscripts that the Vatican and other churches have appropriated and placed in their own storerooms, libraries, and museums. But where is the factual, tangible proof that the Vatican inherited these sacred items and retains them until today? The Israeli Foreign Affairs Ministry Security Services may already have evidence about 50 years ago. There was a certain Jewish student, let's call him D.M., who was enrolled in a correspondence course at the Urbaniana, the Vatican's university, upon attending in person for the last semesters of his doctorate, he found himself the only Jew among 17,000 students. DM told me that he was well-loved, but then when push came to shove, both professor and student approached him respectfully in order to convert him. After firmly refusing time after time, a friend of his, later to become one of the Vatican archivists, Cardinal Antonio Samore, offered to show him what used to be his Jewish heritage, the temple vessels, in an attempt to entice him to convert DM agreed to be taken to see them months later at night. When I asked him if there was anything in that cave that had belonged to the temple, he simply replied, everything is there. Did he really see anything or just come close? Many years later in 2002, DM apparently gave sufficient proof to then Foreign Minister Shimon Perez and others who were in negotiation with high-level Vatican officials at the time. If this is true, Israel may already have a solid, well-documented case. So now what? Today, in the 21st century, there's a thriving sovereign state of Israel being the sole worldwide representative of the Jewish people, or the World Jewish Congress, both being adequate addresses to make an arrangement for some sort of reparations deal. In the meantime, Roman Catholic relations with Israel are on the rise. Dialogue and cooperation with the Jewish state are close, and there are even several Jews who have been knighted by recent popes. So why not negotiate over whatever there is now? Before getting to that, however, let the thoughtful reader Peruse through the true story suggesting the Vatican does have much to hide. One of the greatest rabbis in his generation at the beginning of the 20th century was the chief rabbi of Libya, 77-year-old Rabbi Yitzhak Chai Bozavka, an expert in all areas of Torah, both hidden and revealed, who authored many outstanding books. In 1929, Italy's king, Vittorio Emmanuel III, came to Tripoli for a royal visit. Libya was then under Italian rule, and the Jews of the city made a huge banquet reception, indeed fit for a king, with their beloved chief rabbi at the forefront. Rabbi Bozovka made quite an impression on the monarch, and before the king set sail back to Rome, he invited the rabbi to attend the wedding of his son, the prince. A year later, the rabbi received the royal invitation, but declined to go due to being weak, although he did add the question, why am I needed, though, when you have the pope? Within 48 hours, the king sent a telegram back stating not to worry and that he, um, 
he very badly wanted the rabbi to bless the new couple again. He offered to send him his royal boat, give him all the kosher food and accommodations that were required, and even signed it, your friend the king. The rabbi reluctantly agreed, and when he arrived in Rome, he was treated like royalty, and the wedding was a huge success. As the ceremonies came to an end, the king asked the rabbi if there was anything he could do for him. Bozovka responded that he so desired to see the holy vessels of the Jewish temple in the cellars of the Vatican. When the king first heard this, he refused, saying that there is a separation of church and state and that he didn't have jurisdiction over the pope in these matters. The two didn't exactly get along. Nevertheless, after much prodding, the king went and managed to convince the pope, making him an offer he couldn't refuse, but on the condition that it was only the rabbi alone. That day, he was even invited to to the Holy See for a personal audience with the pontiff. Late that night, and after much spiritual preparation, the rabbi met the guard at the Vatican gates and his students remaining outside and went down the steps four stories under St. Peter's Museum to a hidden maze of ancient galleries attached to the necropolis. After finally reaching the cave entrance, he saw what he saw and writes in his book of responsa that he saw enough and was not capable of seeing anymore. He then turned around and practically ran out of the building. Upon exiting, his students were shocked to find that his face was actually shining. From that day forth, the rabbi took it upon himself to abstain from speaking until he died on February 21st of 1930, 40 days later. Another story about the famous rabbi Benjamin ben Yona of Tudela, a Jewish merchant from the modern Navarre, Spain, he spent significant time in Rome after the election of Pope Alexander III in 1159 and again from November 1165 until 1167 and his mission was to record the lifestyle of Sephardi Jews across Europe and Africa. His travels took him from Spain to France, Italy, Turkey and the Near East including Beirut and Jerusalem. A well-known Iberian traveler, he kept complete and extremely accurate records in his travelogue, as noted by his contemporaries. And when the rabbi passed through Rome in the 1160s, he noted the honorable position of the city's Jewish population, as well as the wonderful buildings there. Was he credible, though? Evidently, the commentators on this work held their subject in high esteem. A commentator that translated the itinerary in 1840, A. Asher, had glowing praise for Rabbi Benjamin. The whole work abounds in interesting, correct, and authentic information on the state of the three quarters of the globe known at this time, and in consideration of these advantages, stands without a rival in the literary history of the Middle Ages. None of the productions of the period is as free from fables and superstitions as the travels of Benjamin of Tudela. Tudela wrote, Rome is the head of the kingdoms of Christendom, and there live about 200 families of Jews who are respected and who pay no tax to anyone. And now, folks, for the meat and potatoes. In Rome there is the cave where Titus, the son of Vespasian, stored the temple vessels that he brought from Jerusalem. This was before popes took up residence in the late 1300s at the Vatican. It appears that indeed vandals didn't run off with the whole horde after all. There is an old picture in my possession of that mysterious corridor in front of the cave replete with creepy skeletal people embalmed to this day, 50 on each side and showing the huge arched wooden door at the end. This picture was taken at least 50 years ago with the custodian guard wearing all black and holding a lantern, especially attesting to, to Della's account. 
Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs at the American Jewish Committee, has a different approach. Rosen, who headed the International Jewish Committee for Interreligious Consultations, known as the IJCIC, the broad-based coalition of Jewish organizations and denominations that represents world Jewry in its relations with other world religions, was granted a papal knighthood in 2005 for his contribution to Jewish-Catholic reconciliation. He was also chosen to lead the famous 2013 prayer service with the Pope, PA President Mahmoud Abbas and Shimon Perez at the Vatican. Rosen suggests approaching various museums in Israel that already had exhibitions of Vatican art and archaeology, which had come from Israel originally, and suggesting a loan arrangement for a limited period to display some ancient vessels of their choice. And this would constitute a win-win for both parties and would certainly be a major event. Rosen cautions that the whole idea of restoring artifacts of cultural or religious heritage back to their countries of origin is a complex one that must take into account the interests of the country that currently possesses the artifacts, among other things. Can, or more importantly, should Israel make use of today's international laws of reparation? This can be considered as well, but then uncomfortable issues are bound to arise. For instance, in this age of political correctness, the following might have to be addressed. Are the Jewish people still the legitimate owners of this ancient treasure? What about replacement theology? Could it be that after 2,000 years behind closed doors, the ownership of these historical religious artifacts is being debated and disputed? The same way, for instance, that the legal ownership of Jerusalem is debated and disputed, and this author says yes. This is not just food for thought. Believe it or not, and with all due respect, he said, I have reason to suggest here, without getting into detail, that this is part and parcel of a new attitude and approach, an indication of what's really being discussed in the long corridors of Rome, the United Nations, the EU, and also the PA. It even has a name, Lawfare. Here's a case in point. Not long ago, a boss had a personal consultation with Pope Francis after agreeing that the two-state solution was the only way forward to make peace with Israel. A boss stated that with respect to the advent of a Palestinian capital, Jerusalem's identity must be preserved through a special internationally guaranteed status. In other words, the territory that used to belong to the Jewish people so long ago does not necessarily mean that it belongs to Israel today, according to Abbas. There's more. The official liaison of the Pope to Israel, Archbishop Giuseppe Lazzarato, Apostolic Nuncio in Israel, and Apostolic Delegate in Jerusalem and Palestine, stated in an official letter dated November 15th of 2013 that if the temple treasures do in fact still exist, surely the church would return those lost items to their legitimate owners. Let that sink in a bit. I'm willing to make a wager that as sure as the sun rises in the east, if Vatican officials were to claim that they own it all, having acted as paternal preservationists, as it were, and that the treasure would theoretically be kept in a Vatican Jewish museum somewhere, everything would change. Indeed, this is, in fact, Plan B. No more need for the Vatican to ignore the elephant in the room. Diplomatic evasion no longer required, and yes, at that point, I'm sure that the chief prefect would take whatever they have out for all of humanity to see. And let's be clear, though, Plan A isn't politically correct, but in this author's view, it's the truth that this vast treasure was, is now, and will always be Jewish, with its home ultimately in Jerusalem, the united capital of Israel. There are several people alive that can personally attest to being eyewitnesses of the Vatican possessing temple vessels, including the menorah candelabra. 
Will any one of them come forward and expose what they know along with themselves? No, and I quite frankly don't blame them. That might be unwise. It doesn't end there, though, because if this were just a judicial court setting, and it isn't, the majority would agree that there is enough information already on file to have reasonable or justifiable cause to move forward. What this means in our case is that making the museum deal is starting to look better and better. After over 25 years of research into the whereabouts of the lost temple treasures, more Vatican details have been included in my book series, The Ark Report, including the existence of the oldest and very fragile Torah scroll taken from the temple building, the golden head plate of the high priest with the holy name of God engraved on it the seats in Hebrew. Well, it's actually a crown that the high priest wore and I think a ribbon tied it in the back. Let's see. They have remade the seats. I've seen it on the Temple Institute website. And the Torah scroll taken from the temple building the giant curtain that hung from the temple entrance, Perachet in Hebrew, that still has the tear from Titus' sword in it, trumpets, and various other ritual copper altar utensils to boot, as mentioned previously and documented by Josephus. Thirty-five years ago, a certain outstanding Swiss Vatican guard, now legally blind, who was posted close to the dormitories, found out that he was, in fact, Jewish. This inspired him to decide to open the gate at night and make his way all the way down. He speaks of walking right to the end and finding a narrow, cramped tunnel that leads to a room of statues, a mysterious hallway, and then the cave where he saw and apparently nearly touched the menorah candelabra, apparently shining with a white light. The next morning, he apparently told the whole tale to the chief rabbi of Rome at the time, Rabbi Elio Toaf, who was known to have testified to its truth. But back down to business, the main concern now really lies in the political level in 2022, far from being outrageous or insulting, approaching the Holy See with the museum idea whereby the Vatican retains ownership and sends a display of certain ancient temple items to Jerusalem presents a brilliant idea. And this is an international trend nowadays. Most people realize that there's no sense in holding on to precious items that are, in a sense, for all humanity in a cellar or cave somewhere. However, if the Holy See feels that the time is not yet ripe for such a gesture, things might get a little messier. Some arbitrary ruling may come forth from the powers that be. Think UN Security Council Resolution number 2334, designating in this case the lost temple vessels as something other than Jewish and therefore should stay put. Although the status quo vis-a-vis -vis the hidden temple treasures has remained in situ for millennia, one can assume that it won't go on like that forever. Either way, like the case of Jerusalem, decision will eventually be made with or without the consent of the Israeli foreign ministry. If things do work out with the Vatican, great. Now's the time and testimonies of various forms are coming in, all of the message that it's high time that the Jews brought their pride and glory back home. And in the meantime, a team of lawyers and ambassadors associated with the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs, the JCPA, are joining me in this undertaking as I meet up with the Department of World Religions at the Israeli Ministry of Foreign Affairs, as well as the Papal Nuncio to Israel, Archbishop Adolfo Tito Yelana. My aim ultimately is to identify the sacred items mentioned above at the Vatican by cross-referencing them with the earliest acquisitions of the Vatican, including 12th 
through 13th century as they appear in their original inventory listings. It's interesting to note that this manifest can be found in the papal secret archive located behind a heavy door at the end of a corridor on the lower floor of the Tower of the Winds, originally built in 1578. Only the chief prefect has this key. This inventory list actually predates the time when the popes first used the Vatican as a place of residence beginning in 1377. If things don't work out with the Vatican, it's not so great. The state of Israel, therefore, should start preparing a legal reparation case, arguing that the ancient temple artifacts, wherever they may lie, fully belong in Jerusalem as the everlasting national heritage of the Jewish people. Unless this happens, we might have to face a new reality coming down from those long corridors sometime soon. Now let's finish off with some big something not known before, something new that has added impulse to this whole undertaking. There have been many stories written about this subject matter before, but none has tackled the fact that up to 10 incense shovels have been found in Israel over the many years of biblical archaeology here. I know because I've held them in my hands. 2,000-year-old bronze, now green, of course, shovels that are about 40 centimeters long that can still be used today. They were found all over Israel, from Jerusalem in the region of the temple area itself to cities near Tiberias in the north and on the shores of the Kinneret. They all have one thing in common. They belong to the various synagogues that were in Israel during the late Roman period, some perhaps being consecrated for the temple itself. Many of these treasures were sent abroad to places such as Abu Dhabi, South Korea, and Singapore, while others went to Rome, acquired by the Vatican, and even Beverly Hills. They fit the description of the Makta incense shovels perfectly, being the same size and shape of those utensils that were used by the priests in the Herodian temple, as described in the Talmud. Why does this matter? Because it turns out that the Vatican is party to some of the international conventions regarding restitution and reparation of ancient cultural artifacts to the original countries of origin. This particular item would not prove difficult to find in the Vatican inventory list on my upcoming trip to Rome where I would learn not only how many they have but the location as to where actually or exactly they are being kept. So, this was written by Harry Moskoff, and he's an investigative archaeologist, temple scholar, film producer, and author of the Ark Report. And, of course, uh, Begley interviewed him. I think that he's some sort of agent as well, <laughs> I must say. Um, I think he used to live in Canada, and then all of a sudden he had like some inside road in Israel and lives in Israel. So, anyway, maybe he's Mossad, and he's checking out all of this stuff. So, this was written uh, February 10th of 2022. So then, Israel 365 News just put out this article October 23rd, 2023. That was a really good day for me, as a matter of fact. Something really amazing happened to me. But um, Diana Ketterman sent me the article, so I wanted to read this because it's a current update just the other day. So it said, Leading Italian Parliamentarian Rome wants to return temple vessels to Israel. So now they're actually admitting that they have them. Recently at a large gathering in Jerusalem, a leading Italian parliamentarian said to the Minister of Tradition that Rome has possession of the Jewish temple's vessels and wants to return them to Israel. Rabbi Shmuel Eliyahu, the chief rabbi of Sefed, is the son of Israel's former chief rabbi, Mordecai Eliyahu, and the father of its current Minister of Tradition, Amikai 
Eliyahu, and he recently told a large gathering in Jerusalem that a leading Italian parliamentarian from Italy's ruling party contacted his son, the minister of tradition. The Italian parliamentarian said that Rome has possession of the Jewish temple's vessels and wants to return them to Israel. According to Rabbi Eliyahu, the representative of Italy's ruling party, a leading member of the national parliament, recently requested a Zoom meeting with Israel's minister of tradition. In the request for the meeting, he said it was very important to him, absolutely vital. When they eventually connected, this is what he told Israel's minister of tradition. He said, every day from my office, I see the Arch of Titus. It's hard to miss it. It's big and impressive. And everyone can see what's displayed on it. Jewish slaves carrying off the Jewish temple's implements into exile 2,000 years ago. We defeated you. We destroyed your temple, massacred your people, including crucifixions, and exiled the Jews throughout the world. And I suppose you deserved it he said. Jewish tradition itself says this, 2,000 years have passed and since then and you have undergone a deep change. You have returned to the land of Israel. And I suppose you also deserve to return. God promised that you would one day return. And that time is now. You have been blessed in a way we haven't. In Italy, we have one of the lowest birth rates in the world. We unfortunately compete with Spain and Japan for the bottom of the list. People here don't want to get married. They just want to enjoy themselves. They don't care about the next generation. There is a values crisis, and if we don't solve it, all the incredible traditions of Rome and Italy will be lost. In 20 years, there will only be old people in Italy. Immigrants from Africa will overwhelm us in Rome, and all of Italy will be no more. The Italian birth rate is about 1.2 children per woman, whereas in Israel it's about 3.0. But Israel is a miracle. You have succeeded in educating your people. There is marriage, love, trust, and family values. The average number of children in Israel is double the average number of children in Europe. This is not just Italy's problem. It's the problem of all of Europe. Your nation has been chosen by God to teach the world values. The Israeli minister could not believe his ears. But all this was just a promo to the revelation that the Italians shared the next. We have in Rome the implements of the Jewish temple, the golden menorah, and many other temple vessels and tools that we took from Jerusalem 2,000 years ago. With these vessels, you brought light into the whole world. They are with us. By keeping them, perhaps we're preventing you from fulfilling your destiny. If so, we will return them to you. If you want them, take them. It won't be easy, but if this is what will enable you to fulfill your divine role, then please, they are yours. They are laying in our cellars. We aren't doing anything with them. This admission comes after over a hundred years of denial by the Vatican that it possessed the temple implements. And of course, I told you, you know, Gershon Solomon tried to write letters. He told the rest of us, please, here's the address, write your personal letter, and asked for them to be returned to Jerusalem. So they denied it at the time. Um, in 2013, for example, the Archbishop Giuseppe Lazzarato of the Apostolic uh, Nunziature in Israel wrote in a reply to an Israeli inquiry that the Vatican did not have the temple vessels. I said to myself, is this for real? Apparently so. 
Since 2000, the Israeli birth rate has continually risen, and this is the exact opposite of every other developed and developing nation. Everywhere in the world, the birth rate is dropping, and with us, it is rising. It's all the result of education values of God's blessing. Through you I will bless all the nations of the world. Fill the world with your glory, and all of creation will say the God of Israel is king. So here's what I already know about this situation with these ancient vessels, because, you know, I told you that Rabbi Richmond, before he had this attitude that they should be worshipped, and started speaking those things out of his mouth. I heard him speak, and I do recall him saying that it didn't matter really whether or not about the vessels. Like if they kept denying it was okay because they were already building new vessels for the new third temple that they planned to utilize in the third temple. So I don't think that they are really concerned about whether they get them back or not. I mean, sure, they'd love to have them back, but in other words, they don't really need to utilize them because they have brand new vessels that were commissioned from artisans and, you know, different silversmiths and that made the trumpets and they had new trumpets made. So, you know, um, all kinds of vessels. I mean, you, when you go to the Temple Institute, it's kind of like a museum, but, you know, it's like all of the vessels that they plan to use for the Third Temple. Technically, they really don't need them for use in the Third Temple. But I do think that they would like to have them back, especially the gold menorah and whatever else is in there. I mean, I'm wondering if it's the curtain that was ripped in twain <laughs> um, when Jesus, when he was on the cross and an earthquake happened and the temple curtain was torn in two. So I'm wondering if they have that. I would not be surprised. And it's really a tragedy that they have so much proof of the Lord and Jesus and everything and they hide it from people from all of humanity and this is really what they've done with the Shroud of Turin because you know when I talked to Barry Schwartz on the phone he was the STIRP team official shroud photographer and God allowed me to meet him and speak to him on the phone and everything. He gave me pictures for my book and everything of the shroud. And he was telling me that they only gave them something like a week to do the investigations on the linen cloth. And somehow they prevented them from having enough time to fulfill those seven days and he said something about that they only had two to three days that they actually got to perform the scientific investigation so you know one of the miracles of the shroud is that the image is only on the very surface of the cloth and it's only on fibers that are one-tenth the size of a human hair which is not even possible at all humanly. So this is one huge miracle. So, um, you know, they have proof of having the shroud and the sidereum and everything and other relics of the apostles that were in the Hagia Sophia church that was a church until the Crusades and the Muslims took it over. And then they painted over all of the paintings, the beautiful paintings of Jesus and the apostles that were inside there and covered it over with their Islamic uh, graffiti, I guess you could say. It really defaced it. 
So a lot of the artifacts were taken during the Crusades. They were taken to um, Venice. They were taken to Spain. Um, you know, they were taken to Rome. They were taken all over in Europe. So this is why you had, you know, like the crown of thorns was said to be in Paris. And during the French Revolution, they moved it um, from one chapel to another. So that's how a lot of these artifacts got scattered. They had been collected in Constantinople. And then when the Crusades happened, the church was so big that they actually had riders on horses come riding into the building. So they literally captured artifacts that had been gathered there like a museum of relics of the apostles and of Christ and everything, or of the Messiah. So this is the whole history of how everything happened. Now, there's also um, said to have been the potential of the Ark of the Covenant being buried, you know, where Ron Wyatt said it was. So, anyway, I have a story about that in my book, which is very, very profound. So, I just thought I would elaborate on this and tell you what happened with myself writing a letter. And uh, this was back when... You know, like, right around the time I wrote my book, 2007, and it was published in 2015. So all of that time, you know, I spent writing and editing. If you want to get a copy of my book, it's The Almond Tree, Aaron's Rod, The Messiah, King of Israel. And, um, you know, it has various archaeological things in it, as well as botanical things and... True revelations of Yeshua, Jesus Christ of Nazareth, that you would find extremely incredible. So, it's at olivepresspublisher.com, where you can order it. And if you want to support my channel, it's paypal.me forward slash kkrococo. And... Uh, donations can be sent by mail at Kimberly K. Ballard, B-A-L-L-A-R-D, P.O. Box 246, Niwot, N-I-W-O-T, Colorado, is C-O, 80544. So I hope you found this interesting, and um, it'll be interesting to see whether they're now going to drag these things out of this cave under the Vatican. I mean, that would just be astonishing to see. And the very fact that nobody's really been allowed to see them in 2,000 years, except for a rare few people, is really something that would be astonishing if they brought them out. And suddenly, you know, in an old Torah scroll from the temple... I'm sure they had a lot more than one scroll, so it would probably be a series of biblical scrolls, you know. Um, and I wonder if they have artifacts from the first temple as well, the Temple of Solomon, because some of the relics, you know, have been dispersed and... I'm sure that they were saved, but they were saved by these various kings. And so, you know, Jerusalem being Mystery Babylon, the great mother of harlots, you know, she's influenced the kings of the earth. And all of her artifacts were taken out of Jerusalem and taken to Rome. So this is truly fascinating stuff. I, I really think it would be incredible to see this stuff. I mean, from the second temple and to know that Jesus would have seen it and his eyes would have looked at it. That is something I just wanted to share. I hope you enjoyed it and I'll see you in the next video. Shalom and have a good night. And I probably will be loading this in the morning. So I'll see you then. Good night for now.